Alrighty, so this is going to be a recording of the lecture that uh, we were supposed to have in class today, but ended up not um, since everybody was out sick. Um, I think everybody and their mother basically is sick on campus. Anyway, um, so we're going to be going over the origin of life and how life actually started on Earth. We won't go through every detail of this process. Um, that would take an entire semester to do. We're just going to cover the major important aspects. Um, there are two PowerPoints that I made for you that are condensed versions covering the material that we're actually going to talk about. And then you have one full PowerPoint that's like 185 slides that has details on every single era um, for you to go through, especially if you're going to be doing the extra credit presentation. Um, all right, so let's begin. Um, the origin of life is a great mystery. Uh, it's kind of the ultimate chicken and egg conundrum. Um, there are many ideas about how the earth may have formed and how life appeared and evolved, but nothing that's explicitly concrete or set in stone. Figaro, you want to lick your butt somewhere else? Go on, go on. Would you die someplace else? Um, nothing that's set in stone, and that's because there's a limited amount of information available. Um, although we can't uh, directly address how life actually arose on Earth, um, we have been able to test and formulate hypotheses about what did or may have um, occurred. Now, most scientists tend to agree, what is this? Tend to agree on two points. And that's, I don't know what happened here. I'm trying to fix it. I'm just making it worse. Anyway, they tend to agree on two points. And that's first that the Earth is billions of years old. That's one. Um, the other is that the conditions of Earth that, that exists now are very different from what existed back then. Um, oh my goodness, this is going to drive me crazy. Oh, there we go. Okay, I don't know what that was. I think I was trying to be fancy with the gadgets up here. All right, let's close out of that. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, so those are the, the two points that they tend to agree on when it comes to the origin of Earth. Um, today, the most widely accepted hypothesis um, of the Earth's origin suggests that the solar system was formed by um, a condensing nebula, which is a cloud of gas and dust in space. About 4.5 billion years ago, um, the Earth formed by accretion from a cloud of interstellar material um, orbiting the sun. Now, between that time and about 4.2 billion years ago, um, so going into this zone here, the Earth went into a cooling period, so it began to cool. Um, and during that time, you had the formation of the early atmosphere and oceans. Following that cooling period, uh, prebiotic chemical reactions began to create the building blocks of life, the early organic monomers. Um, and then in between 3.5, 3.6 billion years ago um, was when we had our last universal common ancestor. So that's when uh, our ancestors first arose. That's when life started. Um, and the process of diversification began that um, enabled the fashioning of the tree of life that we have now, per se. Now, when we talk about early Earth, 
um, or refer to that concept. Uh, we're referring to the conditions and transitions that occurred on Earth between um, about 4.4 and uh, 2.6 billion years ago. So that kind of date range represents um, our reference of early Earth. Now for the first 700 million years, early Earth was very violent, very hot. Um, there was intense volcanic activity. There's no ozone layer to block UV radiation. So high um, levels of radiation kind of accumulating in pockets um, as the Earth began to solidify. Um, and also a lot of electrostatic or electric um, activity in the atmosphere as it was forming. Um, when the Earth began to solidify, volcanic eruptions released gases in a process called outgassing. And this created the primordial anaerobic atmosphere. Um, anaerobic meaning no oxygen. So there was no free oxygen present in the early atmosphere. Um, this atmosphere would be would have been toxic to us um, in today's standards. Um, instead, the atmosphere was composed of gases like um, ammonia, methane, carbon monoxide, and nitrogen gas. So again, it would have been toxic to us today. Um, as the planet cooled, water vapor condensed and fell as rain. Um, and when it did that, it started to collect in pools at the surface of the solidifying Earth. And once water was present, um, organic compounds could form. Now, signs of oxygen actually occurring freely in the atmosphere and oceans um, that first appeared roughly 2 billion years ago. Um, however, oxygen was present before then. Oxygen was actually present about 3 billion years ago. Um, but at that time, it didn't exist as free oxygen. And we know this from evidence that's provided by um, what are called banded iron formations. Um, these are a type of geologic phenomena that occur on old sedimentary rocks um, in the oceans from a, a reaction between dissolved iron and oxygen. So the banded iron formations show that the atmosphere and oceans um, once had no, ox had no oxygen freely um, existing, but it was being produced. Um, photosynth photosynthetic organisms were at that time making oxygen, um, but it reacted immediately with the iron dissolved in seawater to form iron oxide. Um, and those minerals were then deposited on the ocean floor, and that's what created those banded iron formations. Um, once all of that iron or dissolved iron was used up, um, the actual levels of oxygen in the atmosphere and the oceans began to rise. And that's when you start to have the accumulation of free oxygen. Um, this is a picture of a banded rock formation uh, from Canada, in one of the museums. Um, the dark layers on this boulder, so these darker regions here, um, they're mainly composed of magnetite. Um, well, the red layers are a different form of silica that is colored uh, red by tiny iron oxide particles. So that's just what they mean by these banded iron formations. Um, some geologists even su suggest that these layers may have formed annually with the changing of certain seasons if they existed at that that um, in the primordial atmosphere, um, or even as the conditions changed. Alrighty, so that's the formation of Earth, right? So now we can move on to the evolution of life. Um, to understand how life 
evolved. Uh, there's kind of three concepts that we need to cover or to recognize. Um, the first is how small inorganic molecules gave rise to the organic compounds critical to life. That's the first uh, consideration. Second, how the organic compounds that were formed were assembled into structures such as um, RNA, peptides, or different vesicles. And then lastly, how those structures then came together to form early protocells um, or protobionts. Um, I tend to kind of put everything in four main steps um, that kind of allow you to walk through these early stages um, in the formation of life, um, getting from point A, which are your inorganic molecules, to Point B, which is a final product of DNA-based cells. Um, so kind of the, the four major steps um, to go through or, or how we're going to map out this lecture is, first, you needed the abiotic synthesis of organic monomers from inorganic molecules. Second was the abiotic synthesis of polymers. Third, the formation of pre-cells. And then fourth was separate self-replicating molecules. Those were kind of the major stages and events that would eventually lead up to this final or ultimate product. So we'll begin with the first one, right? The abiotic synthesis of organic monomers. How did that happen? Well, um, the first major um, theory about how you had the uh, formation of these organic compounds from inorganic molecules um, arose in the 1920s um, with a Soviet biologist named Alexander Oparin and um, J.B.S. Haldane. They independently proposed nearly identical hypotheses um, for how life originated on Earth. Um, their hypotheses were then fused together to form the uh, formal single hypothesis uh, recognized as the oberin haldane hypothesis. Um, in this hypothesis, they proposed that early life forms arose from uh, what was known as a prebiotic soup. Um, prebiotic soup or primordial soup was a term coined by Operin. Um, he actually created what was called the primordial soup theory. Uh, now this theory suggests that about 3.8 to 3.5 billion years ago, life began in water masses um, as a result of the combination of chemicals from the atmosphere and some form of energy to make the building blocks of life, more specifically amino acids. Um, and those would then evolve into your early life forms. Um, so the, the whole theory, uh, you kind of map it out like this. First of all, the early Earth had a chemically reducing atmosphere. Um, and this atmosphere, uh, when it was exposed to energy in various forms, produced simple organic compounds. Um, Again, these organic compounds were the early building blocks of life. They were monomers, um, so amino acids, uh, monosaccharides or your simple sugars, nucleotides. Now, in order to actually produce these organic compounds, um, the uh, atmospheric chemicals and gases needed to be converted. Um, and in order for them to be converted, you needed energy. Energy was required for that process. Um, so Oprah and Haldane proposed several different sources uh, for this, this energy or several sources that may have served or provided the energy for that conversion. Um, the predominant ones being um, ultraviolet light or ultraviolet uh, radiation and lightning. Those were kind of the two 
primary sources that they believed served as the energy sources allowing for the conversion of atmospheric chemicals into organic molecules in this anaerobic um, environment. Um, they also proposed other sources, uh, such as cosmic rays, um, the volcanic eruptions occurring either at or below the surface of the ocean um, at deep sea vents, even the Earth's internal heat they thought could have could have served as an energy source. Um, so once you had the conversion of the gases into organic compounds, these compounds accumulated in a quote unquote soup of various compounds. You can actually think of the water masses that encompassed the surface of the earth as being these pools of organic molecules that were held in suspension. Um, and those compounds were then further transformed, right? And from that, you had the development of more complex organic polymers. So polymers are just long chains of simple organic molecules. They're long chains of monomers. Uh, so these are um, your, many of your macromolecules, right? Your proteins, uh, RNA. Um, and a lot of them had specific functions or could take on specialized functions. Um, for example, they could act as enzymes that could catalyze metabolic reactions. Um, and then from those organic polymers, you had the development of life or the formation of protocells. So that was kind of the map of this whole theory and hypothesis. Um, and again, the root of their hypothesis is that they proposed that life forms arose from that prebiotic soup as coined by Operin, um, more specifically through a process called abiogenesis. Um, this refers to the chemical formation of um, living materials or um, organisms from non-living materials. Now with every hypothesis, um, there needs to be some sort of testing, right? You need to test the plausibility of any hypothesis that's made. Um, this is where the Miller-Urey experiment um, comes into play. So this experiment uh, tested the plausibility of the Oprah and Haldane hypothesis and um, the prebiotic soup theory. Um, and this was done by reconstructing and simulating conditions of early Earth um, as outlined in the Oprah and Haldane hypothesis. Um, to simulate lightning in the early atmosphere, um, electric uh, current was set up between two um, adjacent electrodes. And this current, in turn, interacted with a mixture of gases. Um, that were held in this large condensation chamber. Um, these gases could be uh, stuff like methane, hydrogen, ammonia, um, but based on the, the combination of gases used, they were actually able to form um, numerous amino acids. Um, so this apparatus was able to produce these amino acids, um, which are the building blocks of life, based on the protocol outlined by the Oprah and Haldane hypothesis. So that showed that this hypothesis was valid. It gave uh, credential and uh, plausibility to that hypothesis. All right, so that wraps up kind of how we got from inorganic molecules to organic uh, compounds, right? So that covers the first step. Right, the abiotic synthesis of your organic compounds occurred largely through abiogenesis in this prebiotic soup, uh, following what's outlined in the Oprah and Haldane hypothesis. All right, so great. We have 
organic compounds. So the next stage in the development of life is the um, abiotic synthesis of polymers. Right? So how did we get from organic compounds to polymers? Um, the major or uh, kind of the dominant thought on that is um, that these uh, complex molecules and polymers were synthesized um, through abiogenesis on the surface of mineralized solids. Um, mineralized solids being such layers as clays or montmorillonite, even limestone. Um, these mineral layers will, uh, or mineral surfaces will form layers. Um, and these layers act as scaffolds. Um, and those scaffolds specifically is what, or what thought to have um, enabled these, uh, the synthesis of polymers. Um, again, when you have uh, layered minerals, um, they allow, or there's, I should say, there is, um, microscopic spaces in between each layer. And those layers can trap stray organic molecules in between the kind of the rigid sheets of atoms making up those layers. Um, and in those spaces, the organic molecules are held very close together and that allows them to uh, react with one another to form more complex compounds. So in those microscopic spaces between the mineral layers, um, you have the concentration of reagents, right? Reagents in this case being your organic molecules. Um, another important concept is the fact that these uh, layers of, of minerals are electrically charged, right? They're made up of many cations and ions and their ionic properties or um, their ability to donate or provide ions um, allows them to act as binding surfaces for uh, charged um, organic molecules. So what would happen is the organic molecules would bind to the mineral surface, um, for example, bind to the surface of clay, um, and by doing so, that could help align other molecules together so that they would readily polymerize. So in these microscopic spaces between the mineral layers, because of their ionic properties um, and the, the rigid structure of the sheets or their um, kind of scaffold-like um, structure, you have the concentration of reagents, and then the binding to the surface of the substrates um, that enabled the aligning of molecules for polymerization. This is actually how we believe um, early and kind of the first chains of RNA uh, were formed. Uh, through this process, um, they could actually self-assemble on mineralized solids. Um, in this specific case, it's uh, clay may have been utilized, but it's more likely um, a mineral known as Montmor Mont sorry Montmorillonite um, kind of served as the the early um, surface for uh, the creation of these RNA chains. Um, Montmorillonite is a very soft phyllosilicate group of minerals um, that form uh, when they precipitate from water as crystals. Um, and they are comprised of three layers. Um, they have a layer of that contains aluminum that's sandwiched between two silicate layers. Um, now, montmorillonite is important in this, this case for the formation of RNA chains. Uh, because they concentrate nucleotides um, and they provide metal ions to catalyze their polymerization. Now, when we 
talk about chains of RNA, um, a chain of RNA is essentially a polynucleotide, right? Polynucleotide meaning many nucleotides. RNA is a nucleic acid. The monomer that's forming the base structure of that nucleic acid are nucleotides. So when you put many nucleotides together, you get your nucleic acids. In this case, you get RNA. Um, so by concentrating nucleotides and providing metal ions um, to catalyze their polymerization, you could have the formation, um, and as it's been done in practice, you can have the formation of these polynucleotide chains or these early chains of RNA um, that could then detach. And um, these polynucleotides have a tendency to copy themselves using complementary base pairing. Right? So you could get um, strands or ch uh, chains of RNA that would self-assemble and then um, could detach from the layer and replicate itself per se, or make a copy of itself. Um, so it's likely this was catalyzed or the formation of early RNA was catalyzed on the surface of montmolorinite. Um, it could have also occurred on clay um, because as molecules absorb to uh, clay mineral particles, they become concentrated. So they begin to stick to the surface particles. So clay in this instance, would have been a good source of kind of aligning these molecules and also allowing concentration. So that covers the formation of polymers, right? So um, the abiotic synthesis of polymers likely occurred via the abiogenesis on the surface of mineralized solids. All right, so that covers that next stage or that stage of um, the development of life. So now we move into um, the formation of pre-cells and self-replicating molecules. And this is where things start getting tricky and more complex. Um, so you start off or we started off with kind of this molecular free-for-all of organic compounds. Somehow um, they came together in this prebiotic soup um, to enable the production of early cells, right? So we talked about already right, going from your organic compounds to the formation of polymers, but how did these polymers then become cells? Um, well, in order to form cells, you first need the encapsulation of uh, genetic material and cellular components. Um, in this kind of uh, prebiotic soup, that would have been relatively easy um, uh, as far as getting a membrane to form. Once you have the formation of a membrane, you can enclose certain um, molecular products. It's actually believed that membranes pushed evolution by natural selection forwards. Um, because if you think about it, um, so these membranes, in order to form these early cells, were encapsulating a um, strand of RNA and whatever its protein product was. Now, if a piece of RNA codes for a particularly good protein, um, but it's not encapsulated in some sort of protective membrane, it's not separated from the external environment, um, then there's nothing to stop that protein from being used by other molecules. Um, however, if that RNA is enclosed in a membrane, then it kind of can keep its protein to itself, right? So by having the encapsulation of um, early genetic material and early polymers, um, it enabled these early cells to gain selective advantages, right? So the presence of the membrane acted favorably in natural selection, it was selected for, um, and that kind of started the kick point for the um, formation and development of these early cells. Um, now, the 
so again, that that was kind of the, the formation of these proto cells. Like these are the proto cells are the early cells. Um, the first proto cell was just a sack of water and RNA. Um, it required an external stimulus to reproduce. Uh, this would be like cycles of heating and cooling. Um, and it was only made up of two molecular components. Right? So it had RNA replicase and a fatty acid membrane. Right? So it had um, the fatty acid membrane protected it or encapsulated it from the environment. And then the RNA replicase allowed it to have kind of self-replicating RNA as early genes. Um, now, when we talk about protocells, um, before I get too far, protocells essentially are just um, collections of um, organic molecules and polymers that function within and uh, creating a encapsulated system. Um, and that system is encapsulated or separated from the environment by a semi-permeable membrane. Um, in the case with the protocells, that membrane was a lipid bilayer. It was a fatty acid membrane. Um, so again, that early, the first protocell to exist was very, very simple. Right? Again, just a stack of water and RNA in this fatty acid membrane. But over a relatively rapid period in evolutionary history, it began to acquire new traits. And that allowed it to become more complex and specialized. Um, so how did it acquire new traits? Uh, well, this was largely the action of um, ribosomes, right? So ribosomes, we'll get more into them in a bit. Uh, they're folded RNA molecules that are analogous to protein-based enzymes. Um, and they arose and took on jobs such as speeding up reproduction or strengthening the protocell membrane. And as a result of that, uh, protocells were able to become self reproductive. Uh, so that, again, acquisition of a new, new trait, new phenotype. Um, other ribosomes acted to catalyze metabolism, right? So they would catalyze the chains of chemical reactions um, that enabled protocells to tap into nutrients from the environment. So these ribosomes, by uh, arising and then being contained within these encapsulated systems enabled your protocells to acquire new traits, become more complex, and that drove natural selection forward um, as far as the evolution of these protocells. So over time, the protocells, um, again, became more complex. They were able to control the flow of nutrients across a boundary layer, um, kind of going at this little diagram down here, right? So very rudimentary um, transport of nutrients, but they were still able to do that. So they had nutrient acquisition. Um, they could copy genetic material and produce um, Dean products. They were able to um, divide and form um, new daughter cells, right? So they, they had started off very, very simple over time gain new traits that allowed them to become more specialized and more complex. Now, as I said before, it's believed that membranes likely uh, pushed evolution uh, by natural selection forwards. Um, when we talk about early membranes, right, these would have been very simple, very different from the membranes, the phospholipid bilayer and plasma membranes that exist in modern day cells today. Um, these early membranes would have been assembled from simple organic molecules that were present in the environment. 
So again, they would have had a much simpler structure. Um, it's likely that they were composed of single chain fatty acid molecules, uh, such as oleic acid. All right, so your simple fatty acids, um, they have a polar head and a single carbon chain. Right, so when we talk about phospholipids, you have the polar head, but they have two carbon chains. These simple fatty acids only have one um, hydrocarbon chain or their hydrocarbon uh, tail. Now under appropriate conditions, um, these molecules can spontaneously self-assemble um, into lipid bilayers. Um, and that's due to their um, ambivalent behavior, right? Fatty acids are known as amplophiles um, because they exhibit uh, ambivalent behavior towards water. Um, the polar head is hydrophilic, meaning it's water loving. It reacts very well and rapidly with water. Whereas the hydrocarbon chain that serves as the tail is hydrophobic in nature, it's water fearing um, because it's a nonpolar uh, or because the, um, the chain is itself is nonpolar because of the equal sharing of electrons between the atoms, it has no reactivity with water and therefore it's hydrophobic. So because it contains both a hydrophobic and hydrophilic component, um, it has ambivalent behavior towards water, it's an amplophile. Um, that behavior again allows it to self-assemble into these bilayers um, where you have the polar heads interacting with um, the fluid uh, matrix or uh, substance in, of the environment or inside this um, early cell um, and the tails are, are kind of inverted into the center and held in the middle so that they're protected or facing away from the source of water. Um, so with these early membranes, the um, single fatty acids would self-assemble into these uh, lipid bilayers and they would form uh, vesicles. Now, um, the fatty acid molecules um, were, uh, they weren't stagnant per se. Um, they would rapidly move in and out of the membrane to form um, new vesicles um, and they could incorporate into other vesicles to um, actually allow that vesicle to grow in size. More specifically, they could um, assemble in the external environment into these small little pom-pom looking things called micelles. Um, these are small spherical assemblages of fatty acid molecules. Um, again, where you have that self-assembly of the hydrophobic tails um, held inside and hydrophilic heads pointed outwards. Um, the micelles could uh, incorporate themselves into the walls of vesicles, and that would allow the vesicles to grow inside, um, sorry, grow in size. Um, so you have this rapid exchange of uh, your, your fatty acid molecules uh, between the layers of the membrane, um, which is a, a component we're going to talk about in uh, one second. Um, they also rapidly moved in and out of the external environment and um, in and out of external these cells. Now, the movement or this rapid movement between layers of membranes is actually very important. Um, so cells need to be able to import nutrients and export waste. Um, now for our modern membranes, this is relatively simple because we have phospholipids and protein channels. Um, but at this time in evolutionary history with these early membranes, 
you didn't have phospholipids and there weren't protein channels. So without protein channels, having the transport of nutrients and waste across the membrane uh, becomes a little unclear. Right? How did this happen? Um, and it was a big question for a while um, until research was done um, by some brilliant minds at Harvard um, that explored the transport of molecules across this fatty acid membrane. And they found that molecules actually pass through relatively easy across this membrane. Um, they're trafficked by a mechanism called lipid flipping. Right? Lipid flipping sounds like some curse phrase that you throw out when you stub your toe, a lipid flipping. I'm gonna use that from now on. But anyway, it's this uh, trafficking process um, where lipid molecules actually flip-flop from inner to outer membrane. Um, so what happens is uh, nutrients bind to the polar head or the head group of the um, simple fatty acids or single fatty acids. And then those lipids would flip-flop, right? So it would go through lipid flipping and that would pull the nutrients with it's still connected to that polar head across the membrane to the opposite side. Um, so those nutrients could then be released into the lumen of the, the early cell. Um, and this occurred at a very high rate. Um, in uh, modern phospholipid membranes, um, there actually is still a small degree of lipid flipping that occurs. Um, but it's very slow, right? The rate of, at which it occurs is very, very, very slow compared to what was occurring at this moment in time. Um, in modern phospholipid membranes, um, lipids can do this lipid flip-flop, right, between inner and outer membranes. Um, you also have the lateral movement of lipids and rotational. Um, this all contributes to why we say that uh, phospholipid membrane is kind of fluid in nature because you have actual movement of um, the lipid molecules. Um, but the rate, of, again, at which that happens is very, very slow. Uh, it's like maybe once every 10 years, you'll have uh, lipid flipping occur. Um, back at this moment of time, kind of going back here into early membrane history, this was occurring at a much, much, much more rapid rate. Um, again, this was the mechanism for nutrient transport at that time. All right, so you started off with the um, kind of the simple fatty acid membrane. Um, and over time, it um, evolved into the phospholipid bilayer. Um, the same scientist that worked on the kind of the lipid flipping project, um, they also found a selective process favoring membrane phospholipids. Um, essentially, they identified a process of natural selection that allowed for the formation of a phospholipid bilayer from the simple fatty acid membrane. Um, the process itself confers a selective advantage in terms of growth um, on cells that include phospholipids in their membrane. Right? So this was a, a spontaneous variation that occurred. That va variation was then selected for. Right? That's how evolution works. It operates on variation. Um, more sp uh, specifically, uh, this selection favored vesicles that contained um, what was called acetyltransferase machinery. Um, this was the machinery that enabled the synthesis of phospholipids. Right? So if a vesicle had acetyltransferase machinery, 
they were able to synthesize phospholipids and incorporate them into their membranes. Um, now, following this, an evolutionary arms race uh, would kind of arise um, as cells with greater and greater ability to synthesize phospholipids outcompeted their neighbors. And eventually, the membranes would come to be dominated by phospholipids. Right? Again, this was driven and selected for by natural selection. Right? Selection would favor the evolution of um, these phospholipids uh, because the phospholipids acted as transport structures to uh, more effectively move metabolites across the membrane. So first you had the replacement of these fatty acid bilayers with phospholipids. Um, and then following that began the rapid evolution of complex membrane proteins. This is when you start getting these um, ion pumps or uh, protein channels to establish different gradients um, within the cell to, again, enable um, better uh, transport of metabolites into and out of the cell. So that's how the phospholipid bilayer arose. So this is kind of giving us a little summary of where we're at. So we went through early Earth, and we've covered kind of the major uh, steps as far as the evolution of life. But there's still quite a few details left to discuss. Right? We're we're only kind of right here. We're we're just moving out of the uh, prebiotic world. Um, one of the kind of the hot topics when talking about the origin of life is uh, what's known as the transition from an RNA world to a DNA world. Um, as I said before, when I was talking about protocells, they used self-replicating RNA as their early genes. That's what's proposed. Um, you know, kind of the the major problem that was faced for a while as far as this discussion with how life evolved um, was uh, kind of this, so let me back up here. So um, RNA and DNA, they, they require enzymes to replicate, right? So this created another uh, chicken and egg conundrum as to what came first nucleic acids or proteins. Um, in the 1980s, uh, Thomas Cech and Sidney Altman um, discovered that enzymes don't need to be solely proteins. Um, instead, they, they found that RNA itself actually had the potential to act as an enzyme. Um, so that means RNA itself could, in fact, catalyze its own replication instead of employing other enzymes. Um, so this recognition and realization that RNA had what's known as autocatalytic properties um, was a crucial turning point. Um, it was because of that understanding that RNA is thought to have been the first genetic material. Right? It was able to replicate itself uh, without the need of proteins. Um, so in this case, nucleic acids came first. More specifically, RNA was the first genetic material. Um, this is what we refer to as the RNA world. Right. Um, this was a phrase that was coined by Walter, sorry, Walter Gilbert um, to capture the idea that early life from about four to sorry, 0.5 billion years ago was RNA based rather than DNA based. And that's what we're hypothesizing. Now, the RNA world hypothesis proposes, again, that these self-replicating ribo nucleic acid molecules or your self-replicating RNA molecules were the precursors 
to to current life. Um, and our current life is based on DNA, RNA, and proteins, right? So it's accepted or believed that current life on Earth descends from this RNA world. Um, in the RNA world, RNA served as both an information carrier and an enzymatic molecule, right? So it was storing genetic material and it also had catalytic properties. So it was taking on enzymatic roles or functions. Um, it possessed the capability to replicate or copy itself. And again, it had catalytic properties so it could act as an enzyme. Um, this is where uh, ribozymes come into play, right? So um, ribozymes, um, as I said before, they were these folded RNA molecules. Um, and they're capable of performing specific biochemical reactions, uh, very similar to the action of protein enzymes, but they're not protein-based, they're RNA-based. Um, and they have many functions. So uh, some of them can make complementary copies of short stretches of their own sequence or other pieces of RNA. Um, so they have that self-replicating or replicative abilities. Um, there are also some that um, have catalytic activity, which actually degrades nucleotides. Um, so it acts to cut a longer strand of RNA into smaller segments. Um, these are a lot of the crazy ribozymes that still exist today, all right? So this is uh, like um, RNAs P, uh, the hammerhead ribozyme, uh, which is, I believe, is the one that I have pictured here. Um, hairpin ribozyme, there's uh, one in tetrahymena. Tetrahymena is, those are the cool guys that we worked with in, in lab. Um, for the biology class. Uh, I think they have one in group one or two in, of the intron. Um, but there are many examples of ribozymes that are still in existence today. Um, so this is referring to uh, the RNA molecules that have catalytic properties. So um, again, it was this um, revelation that kind of put into play the hypothesis for um, the RNA world. Now there's a lot of evidence uh, for this. Um, many present day proteins um, or protein based enzymes I should say have cofactors um, that are either RNA nucleotides or they're based on such nucleotides. Um, cofactors are non-protein components that are needed for enzymatic function. Um, they either assist that enzyme or they are required um, in collaboration for the functioning or um, effective functioning of that enzyme. Um, Another line of evidence is that DNA is constructed from um, an RNA intermediate. Um, in modern organisms, the deoxyribonucleotides of DNA, so these are the nucleotides that are specific to your chains of DNA, um, are constructed by first synthesizing a ribonucleotide intermediate, right, the ones that are used in RNA, and then removing a hydroxyl group through the action of ribonucleotide uh, reductase. Um, so when we differentiate between DNA and RNA, their, their nucleotides have a different pentose sugar. DNA has um, deoxyribose sugar, RNA has ribose sugar. And the two differ based on 
um, the presence of a hydroxyl group at the second carbon or the two prime carbon. Um, DNA, the deoxyribose sugar, um, does not have a hydroxyl group at that two prime carbon, whereas RNA does. Um, so when you create these DNA nucleotides, again, they're created first from the ribonucleotide, meaning it's created from a nucleotide containing that ribose sugar. Um, and then the special enzyme called ribonucleotide reductase comes along and it removes or reduces that hydroxyl group. Um, by taking out or removing that hydroxyl group, you move or change from that ribose pentose sugar to the deoxyribose pentose sugar. So that's another line of evidence. Okay. RNA is used as a model for creating DNA. Um, the last bit of or major line of evidence is that um, kind of looking at ribosomes, right? So ribosomes are the catalytic enzyme that are used for protein synthesis. Um, this is the um, enzyme that's actually reading or uh, translating the strand of mRNA um, and that's base pairing to uh, the anticodons on tRNA, which are carrying an amino acid. So this is the enzyme that's reading the mRNA and synthesizing the amino acid chain that's going to form a polypeptide from that mRNA. Now, um, this ribosome is uh, a ribozyme. It's made of both RNA and protein components, um, but the structural and biochemical analyses um, have revealed that mechanisms central for translation. So that's, again, this process of assembling a peptide chain based on um, an RNA sequence. It's catalyzed by RNA, not by proteins. That entire catalytic site of the ribosome um, is formed entirely from RNA, right? So translation is catalyzed by RNA. Um, and even if you look at the structure of these ribosomes. Um, this is looking at uh, the ratio of RNA composition versus protein composition in the 50S subunit of a ribosome. You can see that the ratio or proportion of RNA composition is far, far higher than protein. Uh, so proteins are the blue and then uh, the brown is representing RNA. Um, so your ribosomes are uh, ribozymes. They are not even relics of that. They are, are still functioning ribozymes that are crucial to protein synthesis. Um, in fact, protein synthesis can occur in the absence of DNA, but it can't occur in the absence of RNA. So that's a another side point as well. So again, it's believed that when we're talking on the biochemical or uh, this molecular level, started out in an RNA world, uh, where RNA, uh, you had these self-replicating RNA genes that produced more RNA. That then transitioned into an RNA protein world where RNA um, had the ability to self-replicate as well as uh, synthesize proteins. And then from there, we transitioned into a DNA protein world, which is our modern world. Right? Our modern world, again, is composed of DNA, RNA, and proteins. Um, so 
how did we get from RNA and proteins to DNA and proteins? Uh, this is a tricky one for some. Um, it's a lot easier to answer the question as to why such transition would occur. That, that's easy. So it's relatively simple as far as why um, selection would favor transition from RNA to DNA as far as uh, the basis for genetic material. Um, the main reason being that DNA is more stable than RNA um, as far as a site of storage for genetic information. Um, because deoxyribose um, sugar lacks that hydroxyl group, it's more stable, it's less um, reactive, and therefore uh, is better as serving as a stable storage um, medium, I guess you could say, for genetic information, much more stable than RNA. Um, also, proteins are better at catal catalyzing agents um, than RNA. Um, another way to look at it is that if you had this transition, then DNA becomes the, the storage for genetic information, and that kind of frees up RNA and proteins to take on other functions. So RNA can become kind of this intermediate molecule, but also take on a variety of other cellular functions. And proteins can take on specialized functions as far as cellular functioning um, or other uh, traits that, that could uh, serve as an advantage for um, that cell. So that could also have been a reason why you had selection kind of favoring this, this transition. Um, because by moving in, in that sense, by having DNA as storage for genes and then RNA and proteins taking on other functions, you allow for specialization of that cell. Specialized cell is one that ends up gaining selective advantages. Um, so that is a favorable cell to be. So again, it's a lot easier to answer the question as to why that transition may have occurred. It's a lot more difficult and a lot uh, more hairy of a topic to talk about how that transition occurred. Um, I like to break it down into, first of all, what was needed for this transition. Um, in order for there to have been a transition from an RNA world to a DNA world, two very crucial uh, characters would have been needed. First are DNTPs, which are deoxyribonucleotides. These are um, nucleotides that are specific to DNA. Um, you need those in order to form chains of DNA. Um, so that was the major character. That was the, the first major character that was needed. Second were enzymes, um, specifically an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. Um, you needed an enzyme that could uh, catalyze or function on both RNA and DNA. Um, and that's why I say reverse transcriptase. We'll get into that in a moment. So those were the, the two things that were needed in order for this transition to occur. Um, the formation of DNTPs, uh, again, these uh, deoxyribonucleotides um, D or DNA-based nucleotides that arises from um, ribonucleotide intermediate, um, right? So your RNA-based nucleotides serve as kind of the, the starting or building material for your deoxyribonucleotides. Now, as I said before, this happens um, due to the removal of the, the hydroxyl group on this 
to prime carbon. Um, the hydroxyl group is removed and um, you're left with just a, uh, two hydrogen groups on that carbon and that's your deoxyribose sugar. Now the enzyme that catalyzes the, the um, reduction or the removal of this hydroxyl group um, is an enzyme called ribonucleotide reductase. Um, so this would have been needed in order for you to create DNTPs. This was available, then you could have DNTP formation. Um, and it's very likely that this did exist. First of all, it's uh, very ancient as far as um, historic lineage. Like we can trace it very far back in evolutionary history. Um, it uh, kind of evolved out of uh, bacteria into your eukaryotes and archaea um, based on the different classes um, that have evolved over time. But it's likely that you had, again, these self-replicating RNA genes. There was one that um, had the ability to produce this um, enzyme, this protein-based enzyme, and that enabled this selective advantage. It, it, this enzyme created um, DNTPs, and um, again, that allowed for kind of these free-floating DNTPs that when coupled with your second character could enable the formation of um, chains of DNA. Um, again, DNA would have been favored because it's much more stable um, and it's also less prone to error. So DNA um, have, or they use more sophisticated uh, proofreading techniques um, as far as uh, proofreading a, a chain of DNA and uh, correcting mistakes in, in base pairs or uh, sections of the DNA. Um, by decreasing the amount of errors, you can actually create larger genes. So more of the genome can be dedicated to genes or you can have more genes in a genome. Um, so kind of jumping a little bit, sorry. That's another uh, benefit as far as transitioning to DNA. Um, so you have this uh, kind of the, the dawn or the uh, creation, the arisal of the ribonucleotide reductases that enable the creation of DNTPs. Okay, that's great, but it doesn't really help if there's nothing to actually employ those uh, DNA-based nucleotides. And that's where reverse transcriptase comes into play. Um, reverse transcriptase um, arises from um, a, a type of virus called a retrovirus. Um, the retrovirus, to give you an example, um, human immunodeficiency virus or HIV is an example of a retrovirus. Uh, retroviruses are my favorite. They are really awesome um, because the genome of this virus um, is composed of RNA instead of DNA. Um, in a retrovirus, RNA is actually reverse transcribed into DNA, um, which it can then be integrated into the chromosomal DNA of a host cell that the retrovirus infects. Um, and this, the synthesis of DNA is catalyzed by the enzyme reverse transcriptase. Um, so the, the existence of this enzyme shows that genetic information is capable of flowing from DNA to RNA. Um, again, it's what happens is a um, positive single uh, positive sense single stranded RNA strand is used to make um, a negative sense single-stranded DNA template. Um, so this enzyme can act 
on both RNA and DNA, functions on both. So um, it's thought that, again, you have ribonucleotide reductases evolved and created. They're going around creating your DNTPs. Um, it's believed that you then had um, these RNA viruses um, kind of, uh, so they're carrying these um, ribonucleotide reductases. Um, you get uh, some that either have reverse transcriptase or are retroviruses themselves um, that either that either change the their genome from RNA to DNA base, so they become a DNA virus, um, and then that DNA virus infected RNA cells. Um, that's how you got this transition to the DNA world. That, that's one avenue for thought. Um, a lot of it is based on viruses. Right? So this transition likely occurred because of viruses, um, more specifically um, because of horizontal gene transfer um, between viruses and um, other cellular components um, through uh, transduction. Um, so it either operated in that sense. Um, you also could have had um, this RNA um, genome of your last common ancestor um, and RNA viruses, again, based in this RNA world. Um, and that RNA virus um, gained a selective advantage from a mutation in the RNA of another cell. Again, that can occur through transduction. And then if that virus um, obtained some whatever um, property or the, the gene that enabled it to create reverse transcriptase, um, it could incorporate that into its viral genome. And then if it infected another um, RNA cell, it could kind of pass on that uh, gene to that RNA cell. So the RNA cells could have picked it up that way as well. More likely that this had happened, um, that you actually had the um, evolution or the, the spawn per se of reverse transcriptase in these RNA viruses. And that these RNA, some of these RNA viruses um, utilized the reverse transcriptase to become DNA viruses. And then those DNA viruses infected RNA cells. And based on the reverse transcriptase um, properties, and also uh, looking at other properties of retroviruses, um, at their, uh, they have an enzyme called integrase, they could take their uh, DNA genome and incorporate it into this RNA genome and actually you would have that reverse um, in uh, genome, genome type or genome material. Um, so again, it's, it's, we know how it might have happened, but we don't know, okay, this happened, then this followed. It's, still different lines of theory. Um, it's, again, we know what was needed for that to happen. It's a little hard to, to actually say what actually happened with that. So I apologize if my explanation is very jumpy, um, but it's, it's kind of the, the best we can, we can do. Alrighty, so um, moving from um, kind of gene material um, 
looking at the evolution of metabolism. So this was, um, I'm kind of going through the, the major transitions here, right? The transition from inorganic substances to the creation of life forms, the um, transition from an RNA world to a DNA world. Now we're going to talk about the transition um, in metabolism, right? So starting with the simple metabolism of your um, protocells to a more advanced um, metabolic systems. We'll actually progress through um, uh, photosynthesis to your aerobic respiration. Um, so I had said before that other ribosomes were able to catalyze metabolism. Sorry, not ribosomes, ribozymes um, in these early protocells. Um, and it's actually highly believed, well, by catalyzing metabolism that enabled the protocells to tap into nutrients from the environment. Right? So that's a selective advantage. That's a, uh, a favorable trait for these protocells. It gives, gives them an advantage as far as their neighboring cells. Um, now the metabolism that would have existed in these protocells would have been very, very rudimentary. Um, it's believed that it evolved out of um, cocerates, uh, which likely were the early cell type that actually uh, kind of formed the basis for the formation of your protocells. Uh, these are kind of just little bubbles, uh, kind of goes into the, the bubble cells or bubble cell theory. Um, your cosavrits are clusters of charged polymers. Um, they have uh, inner enzymes that could actually perform rudimentary metabolism. And it's likely that that trait was somewhat possessed and then adapted on by ribozymes in protobionts or your um, protocells. So that kind of was the rudimentary metabolism. It, it, it was just this very basic movement of, of nutrients um, across the, the early membranes, um, but nothing highly specialized, just simple rudimentary metabolism. Um, and then we move from your protocells into prokaryotes, right? So um, With that, you had also this evolution um, in metabolism as well. So um, again, at this time, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. Um, so when you had the evolution of protocells into prokaryotes, more specifically bacteria, they were anaerobic. Um, meaning they did not breathe oxygen. Um, and they were also believed to be heterotrophs. So heterotrophs meaning other feeders. Um, they're simply organisms that cannot make their own food. Um, so the, the parents of these anaerobic heterotrophs or anaerobic heterotrophic bacteria, um, bacteria um, that occurred about 3.6, 3.7 billion years ago. Right? That's the appearance of life, right? These are your early prokaryotes, more specifically, their anaerobic bacteria. Um, so you can start mapping out uh, kind of the evolution of metabolism. Right now, these anaerobic, these, well, you start off with the, the protocells, which have this rudimentary metabolism. Then you have the evolution of anaerobic heterotrophs, which 
from their metabolism are using fermentation or anaerobic respiration. Okay, so this is about the, between 3.8 to 3.6 billion years ago. Following that kind of stage in uh, the evolution of metabolism, you had glucose synthesis. Um, so this is the production of glucose, which can be used for energy. Um, this is where you see kind of the dawn or age evolution of autotrophs. Um, autotrophs um, or autotrophic evolution, I should say, evolved very early in prokaryotic history. Uh, the first autotrophs were likely non-oxygenic photosynthesizers, uh, meaning they did not split water and liberate oxygen, right? so they were cyclic only. Um, the first organisms to use non-cyclic photosynthesis or oxygenic photosynthesis means they have the water splitting enzyme um, were likely cyanobacteria, uh, which evolved over 2.7 billion years ago. Um, cyanobacteria are the only photosynthetic prokaryotes that generate oxygen. Um, so again, going back to our, let me see if I can actually like, try to be, oh, I can. All right. So we'll map out the evolution of metabolism, right? So we have our metabolism or respiration evolution, right? Okay, so the first step in this or the first stage, I'll say, following the evolution out of protocells um, is fermentation. Right, so this is also anaerobic respiration. Actually, they're different things, but for now we'll just kind of put them in the same boat. Right, so this dawned with your um, anaerobic heterotrophs. All right, so following that, so that was kind of the the first step following this rudimentary metabolism in your protocells. After that was glucose synthesis, right? And from here you had the um, evolution of your autotrophs. Um, autotrophs. Okay, following glucose synthesis, because um, that arose, um, you had photosynthesis start occurring, but initially it was anaerobic photosynthesis. Um, once there was enough free oxygen um, accumulating in the atmospheres and oceans, then you had the switch to um, an aerobic atmosphere. So you could have aerobic synthesis, followed by aerobic respiration. Um, so that came into play about uh, 2.5 billion years ago, also known as Giganum or uh, abbreviated as GA. So that was shortly after the um, uh, operations or the evolution of cyanobacteria. Um, again, cy cyanobacteria, um, so they uh, were the first aerobic photosynthesizers. Um, they uh, started to come into play about three billion years ago. Um, they formed these structures called stromatolites. Um, which are these large mats on rock surfaces and shallow reefs. Um, and at that time, they started to dominate the oceans. Um, so if we actually go back, I think they're in, oh, are they? 
Yes. Okay. So if you look at this picture, this is a stromatolite right here. Um, so these were those early photosynthesizing organisms that I had talked about before that were producing oxygen in the oceans and the atmosphere. But um, initially, that oxygen was being consumed immediately um, in reactions with dissolved um, iron to form iron oxides, right? That, again, that was the component that was deposited at the um, surface of the, the ocean floor to form the banded rock formations. Now, because of the mass quantity of these stromat stromatolites, um, there, after a, kind of a, a certain threshold level, they were able to um, consume um, the iron in the oceans. And at that point, once the iron had been um, consumed to a low enough level, where you didn't have the spontaneous reactions occurring, you could begin to have the accumulation of free oxygen. So you had the kind of the arisal of these cyanobacteria somewhere around three billion years ago, um, but they didn't really come into strong play until about 2.7 billion years ago. And then between 2.7 to 2.5, you had the operation um, and the, the reactions uh, between oxygen and iron um, from these cyanobacteria, the oxygen coming from, from their photosynthetic operations um, until at 2.5 billion years ago, you kind of reached the threshold in iron concentration um, as far as limiting it in the atmosphere and the ocean, which allowed for the accumulation of oxygen. Um, at that point, when we switched to again, an aerobic atmosphere, that was the game changer. Um, at that time, there was a mass extinction. Um, you had the mass extinction of anaerobic um, organisms and life forms um, because you had complete change in atmosphere. You now had an oxygenated atmosphere. Um, so where we are now, as far as the development of, of life. So you start off with the development or ab abiotic synthesis of organic uh, compounds, more specifically monomers, right? And those then develop into polymers. Uh, which then developed into protocells. And from protocells, you have the evolution of prokaryotes. Um, first were heterotrophic prokaryotes right, in your anaerobic environment. And then you had the evolution of autotrophic prokaryotes. Now, this would then go on um, into endosymbiosis, which enabled the creation of or evolution of eukaryotes, eukaryotic cells, and ultimately the evolution and arisal of multicellular, oh my God, multicellularity. Is what happens to my brain after teaching a full day. Okay, so that's kind of where we've uh, come to at this time. Um, so with the, the switch in uh, metabolism, so you go from your anaerobic to aerobic, aerobic meaning oxidative metabolism. Um, that, again, would have been selected for by natural selection um, because um, it's more energetically efficient, meaning that 
um, with aerobic metabolism, you get more energy out of the products that are um, produced. Um, which, and based on that, the, based on the magnitude of, of difference between the amount of energy that you can get um, from these two forms, that would have strongly selected for your aerobic life forms, um, which is why you had the continuation of natural selection um, moving forward the evolution of these um, aerobic life forms and aerobic metabolism. Um, and after that um, event, right, that's how we've come to the modern atmosphere. I mean, there were many transitions in that meantime, but um, that was kind of the, the major transition from aer anaerobic to aerobic in our, our environment and atmosphere is now aerobic. Um, so I think I'll stop there. My brain is starting to shut off and I'm sure I've probably put you to sleep. You can probably use my lectures as a cure for insomnia, uh, which would be, maybe it would be great. I could probably get some money for that. We all need money. But anyway, I um, do the assignment that you're required to do um, for this lecture video. Um, I hope I did not put you to sleep, and I also hope that this made some sort of sense. Again, it's, it's a difficult topic to go through because there are so many ideas and hypotheses about what may have occurred or what um, happened, but everything, there's nothing that's set in stone um, because, there, again, there's so uh, such a limit of information available. So I know this is a uh, very dry lecture, a lot of information. It's also very jumpy. Um, and I apologize for that. But again, it has to do with the basis that there's only so much we know. It's, it's basically all hypothesized. Um, but I hope that what I was able to tell you did make sense. Anyway, um, enjoy the rest of the night if you are not sleeping already, and don't forget to do your homework assignment.